Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lexi and I'm here at the Bee Museum to do Life Science Live with you this Friday. Um, this is a live video so if you get on right now um, during the video and you have any questions or comments, just type them in the um, comments section or the, um, the chat and that'll pop up so I can answer your questions if you have any. Um, if not, then um, you can watch this later and if you have any questions you can um, still comment them and we'll get um, an employee of the Bee Museum to get back to you and answer your question. We'll start in just a minute and see if anybody gets on. I'm gonna get started. Um, today I want to talk about invasive species. Um, and I'm right here at our competition um, display at the museum. And we're gonna talk about competition and we're gonna talk about um, invasive species and how they compete with the native species. Um, the first thing we need to understand is what is an invasive species. And an invasive species is a species of, anim um, of animals or of a plant that is introduced to an ecosystem that is not natively found and its population increases, they're, um, they can kind of grow out of control and they do damage to that ecosystem and to those plants and animals that are natively found there. So um, an analogy to try to help you understand this, um, imagine you um, are going to dinner and your parents made dinner for five people and you decided that you wanted to invite three of your friends over for dinner without telling your parents. And that means that there's only food for five people, but now um, there are eight people at dinner. And so there's not gonna be enough food. There's not gonna be enough room at the table probably. There's not gonna be enough um, forks or knives or plates, um, not enough water. There won't be, um, and then maybe your parents or your siblings might be annoyed that there are more people there. Um, and so that's kind of an example of how invasive species can affect. Um, they can overpopulate, they can crowd the area, the, the ecosystem that you're in. They can um, compete with the other um, animals and plants that are there, so they can take their resources, so their food and their water. Um, and then they can also do damage. They could um, prey on those animals, those plants and animals that are natively found there. And so. Invasive species are um, a bad thing. Um, they can they negatively affect environments, and so I'm going to talk about how invasive species happen, how they come to be, and then examples of uh, a couple of native or invasive species, and then what scientists and people do to try to combat invasive species. Um, so the way that invasive species happen, the way that they get to a new environment, um, is sometimes intentional and sometimes unintentional. Sometimes they don't want to do it, but sometimes they do. Um, in the case of people wanting to introduce an invasive species is um, the cane toad, and I'll talk a little bit more about the cane toad in a second, um, but most of the time it's by accident. Most of the time we uh, mess up and we don't mean to introduce a new species, but um, it happens because we are, um, our world is globalized and um, there's a lot of travel between countries and continents. Um, that means that if people are moving around, that means plants and animals are moving around too. So either a boat could go from one coast to another coast and carry um, water in that boat um, and bring it across the ocean to a new coast. That could introduce a new species um, or carry plants in it um, or mussels or things like that that could be introduced into a new ecosystem. Um, sometimes when um, lumber, timber is moved, um, from one place to another that can um, carry new species with it and a lot of um, beetles um, and other insects are introduced that way to new environments. Um, and sometimes it's by accident when people release their pets. Um, and that's a big thing. Um, I'm going to talk about the um, Burmese python and the reason why Burmese python is in Florida is because people released their pets. Um, they didn't want their Burmese um, python anymore and so they just got rid of it by releasing it into the wild. Um, kind of a similar thing 
maybe in Utah could be if you had a pet goldfish and you didn't want it anymore, sometimes you'd maybe go drop it um, in a lake or a pond, hoping that it'd have a better life there, or sometimes flushing it down the toilet um, to get rid of those pets. We don't want them anymore, but um, that's um, an irresponsible way to do it because that introduced a new species into an environment. And those goldfish could survive being flushed in the toilet and they could go um, through the pipe system and find a pond or a lake and reproduce and um, become competitors with the native fish that are in that pond or lake. Um, and so it's best if you want to get rid of your fish um, not to flush them down the toilet. <laughs> and so maybe finding them a new home would be the best. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that invasive species can be introduced um, and, how, and the causes that um, occur there. So. The first example of an invasive species I want to talk about is the cane toad, like I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to show you guys a picture of a cane toad. Uh, let's do this one. All right, so this is a cane toad. They are native to Central and South America. Um, and as you can see, they can get really, really, really large. Um, and these toads were introduced to Australia um, on purpose because Australia um, was growing a lot of cane sugar in the early um, 1930s and their cane sugar um, farms were being eaten by the cane beetle and so the farmers wanted to figure out a way to get rid of these cane beetles and so they thought um, that introducing the cane toad would be able to control the beetle population that the cane toad would eat the cane beetle and um, then their crops would be able to survive. And so they took about 3,000 cane toads from Puerto Rico and um, redistributed them in Australia to try to um, combat the beetle population. And this was a really um, bad outcome. They didn't know what would happen. And so um, that group of 3,000 toads grew to be um, over 1.5 billion toads um, they grew out of control and they didn't eat the cane beetles. Um, they didn't help with that um, problem and they just started eating other things. They're um, opportunistic hunters and so they'll eat whatever they can find. Um, and so they would go and they are known to eat um, lots of insects, lots of bugs, um, lots of maybe small mammals um, if they can um, fit them in their mouth. And they also are known to eat like pet food and things like that. And so these toads grew out of control um, and they didn't help with the problem and so they became an invasive species um, and now there are over 1.5 billion and so it's really hard to get rid of those toads now because they um, are so integrated into the ecosystem in Australia. Um, and so the ways that scientists and people are trying to control the population of these cane toads is um, they want to, the best way to do it is to try to get rid of the eggs first. Um, and these cane toads, they, get, they, um, they lay their eggs in creeks and rivers. And so the best way to um, get rid of the eggs is to just find them in the creeks and rivers and remove them. Um, it's hard though, because it's hard to identify what kind of frog eggs they are. They don't want to remove native frog eggs. They want to just remove the cane toad um, frog eggs. And so they, um, it's hard to identify those, and so that's sometimes um, a tricky way to control the population. Um, the locals are encouraged to get rid of the cane toads if they come across them, um, but it's kind of out of control at the moment. And so what um, scientists have noticed is that the plants and animals in Australia have actually started to um, evolve and um, adapt to having cane toads as part of their ecosystem and as part of their competitors. And so at this point, it's, um, it's for the best way for them to, to solve the problem is to just let nature run its course and to um, let the plants and animals adapt to these cane toads since it is um, past the point of getting rid of them. Um, these cane toads are also really hard to get rid of because they're poisonous. Um, and so they don't have a lot, of, um, a lot of predators that can hunt them and eat them because of the poison on their skin and they reproduce a lot. And so that's why their population numbers were able to increase so quickly while in Australia because they didn't have a lot of predators 
and um, they had a lot of babies. And so cane toads are an example of an invasive species. Um, the next one I want to talk about is the Burmese um, python. And I'll show you a picture of the Burmese python. Um, so this is what they look like. They're some of the biggest snakes. They are, here's a picture of how large they can get. Um, they can get really, really thick and really, really long, about um, 16 to 23 feet long. Um, and sometimes they can get as thick as a telephone pole. Here's another one. So um, these snakes, um, they're native to Southeast Asia um, and they are really, really large. And so these snakes um, are commonly held as pets. Um, pythons are known to be a more docile snake and so um, a lot of people that like snakes like to um, own a Burmese uh, python and so um, somebody in Florida owned a Burmese python and like I said earlier when you have a pet and you don't want it anymore sometimes people just get rid of it by releasing it into the wild um, and if those um, animals are not native to that area um, sometimes they'll die and sometimes they won't survive but sometimes they'll survive and um, that can cause a lot of problems for the native plants and animals. And so um, the Burmese python, they don't have many um, um, predators in Florida. They're one of the main predators because they are able to eat really large mammals um, and they're really hard to find. They're very um, sneaky and they're really good at hiding. And so it's really hard for um, them to have any competition with any animals and so they kind of have um, risen to the top of the food chain and um, have caused a lot of problems for other animals and plants there. Um, yeah, so they're, because they're hard to find, um, there's about, we are not sure how many pythons are in Florida, but they think from 30,000 to 300,000. And so that's a big gap, a big range of um, snakes. And so we don't know how many there are. And so it's really hard to control the population when it's hard to count them. Um, and so there's been different ways to combat um, this invasive species. They've tried to train dogs to find snakes. Um, they've even encouraged like competitions for people to go out and hunt snakes and they can earn money for how many snakes they can collect. Um, and so these um, efforts haven't been very effective. And so the, the Burmese python population and problem is still an issue in Florida and they're trying to figure out how to control this invasive species. Um, all right, last example, the carp. Um, right now I am next to our competition um, exhibit and this right here is a June sucker. And um, June, the June sucker is natively found in Utah Lake right here next to BYU. Um, and they're, um, they're um, common um, competitor is the carp. Um, the carp was introduced to Utah Lake um, in the 1800s, 1880s, I think, um, and they um, took over the whole habitat. Um, carp are um, mainly herbivores and so they eat a lot of plants. And so what they do is they'll swim to the bottom of the lake and um, they'll dig up and move and eat all of the plants at the bottom of the lake which these June suckers mainly use that, um, that habitat and those plants to hide their young so that when they're really small and weak, they had a place to protect them so that they weren't eaten by predators. And so um, the carp destroyed the bottom of, the, of Utah Lake and that's kind of why it's so dirty um, is because the carp have just ripped up and torn um, the base of the lake apart. And so these carp um, are competing with the June sucker. The June sucker is only found in Utah Lake and so it's really important that we protect these rare species because um, we can't find them anywhere else. And so um, the carp can cause a lot of problems for the June suckers. It's hard for their babies to um, grow over um, a year old until before they are either hunted because they don't have protection from um, their habitat um, or there's not enough food because the carp um, can eat all of the food that is available in the lake. And so there are a lot of um, 
a lot of initiatives to try to control the carp population. Um, almost every year there's about um, 25 uh, million uh, pounds of carp that are um, are taken out of the lake. And so since 2012, since this started to try to um, re-surface um, the, the gene suckers to bring them back from being endangered, um, the Utah um, Utah Lake has been able to decrease the um, carp population by 60%. So, so far, it's been a very successful um, effort to try to control this invasive species. Um, and the habitat is growing back. Um, it's becoming more healthy and more safe for these dune suckers. And so, um, those are some examples of invasive species. Oh, I'll show you a picture of the carp. I didn't do that. Here is what a carp looks like. There you go. And so these guys compete with the June sucker. Um, and I was gonna show you guys this exhibit a little closely before I stop, but as you can see, this is a June sucker, and I just explained the June sucker, but here are some other animals that um, have been affected by competition and in invasive species. Um, I'll turn this around so you guys can read it. Here we go. So um, the Pinta Island tortoise, um, it competed for food with goats that were introduced to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and because they're competing, um, they became extinct um, without the amount of food that they needed. Um, the numbat is endangered. They were competing with red foxes, um, but there were efforts to remove the red fox. And so um, the numbat was able to recover and um, it didn't go extinct. It's still endangered though. And then the dodo also um, went extinct because it didn't have any predators where it um, was natively found. And so when, um, when other animals were introduced, um, it didn't know how to adapt and it wasn't able to adapt fast enough and so it went extinct. But here is our competition exhibit. And that is all I have for you guys today. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Um, please leave any comments or questions that you have um, in the chat, and uh, we'll see you next week with more Life Science Live and more Discovery Reading. Bye!